Miss Hinch by Henry Sidner Harrison In going from a given point on 126th Street to the subway station at 125th, it is not usual to begin by circling the block to 127th Street, especially in sleet, darkness, and deadly cold. When two people pursue so unusual a course at the same time, moving unobtrusively on opposite sides of the street, in the nature of things the coincidence is likely to attract the attention of one or the other of them. In the bright light of the entrance to the tube they came almost face to face, and the clergyman took a good look at her. Certainly she was a decent-looking old body, if any woman was, white-haired, wrinkled, spectacled, and stooped. A thoroughly respectable domestic servant of the upper class she looked, in her old black hat, wispy veil, and grey shawl, and her brief glance at the reverend gentleman was precisely what it should have been from her to him, open deference itself. Nevertheless, he, going more slowly down the drafty steps, continued to study her from behind with a singular intentness. An express was just thundering in, which the clergyman, handicapped as he was by his clubfoot and stout cane, was barely in time to catch. He entered the same car with the woman, and chanced to take a seat directly across from her. It must have been then after half-past eleven o'clock, and the wildness of the weather was discouraging to travel. The car was almost deserted. Even in this underground retreat the bitter breath of the night blew and bit, and the old woman shivered under her shawl. At last, her teeth chattering, she got up in an apologetic sort of way, and moved toward the better protected rear of the car, feeling the empty seats as she went, in a palpable search for hot pipes. The clergyman's eyes followed her candidly, and watched her sink down, presently, into a seat on his own side of the car. A young couple sat between them now, he could no longer see the woman, beyond occasional glimpses of her black knees and her ancient bonnet, skewered on with a long steel hat pin. Nothing could have seemed more natural or more trivial than this change of seats on the part of a thin-blooded and half-frozen passenger. But it happened to be a time of mutual doubt and suspicion, of alert suspicions and hair-trigger watchfulness, when men looked askance into every strange face and the most infinitesimal incidents were likely to take on a hysterical importance. Through days of fruitless searching for a fugitive outlaw of extraordinary gifts, the nerve of the city had been slowly strained to the breaking point. All jumped, now, when anybody cried boo, and the hue and cry went up falsely twenty times a day. The clergyman pondered, mechanically he turned up his coat collar and fell to stamping his icy feet. He was an Episcopal clergyman, by his garb, rather short, very full-bodied, not to say fat, bearded and somewhat puffy-faced, with heavy cheeks cut by deep creases. Well lined against the cold though he was, he, too, began to suffer visibly, and presently was forced to retreat in his turn, seeking out a new place where the heating apparatus gave a better account of itself. He found one, reasonably enough, two seats beyond the old serving woman, limped into it, and soon relapsed into his own thoughts. The young couple, now half the car length away, were very thoroughly absorbed in each other's society. The fifth traveller, a withered old gentleman sitting next the middle door across the aisle, napped fitfully upon his cane. The woman in the hat and shawl sat in a sad kind of silence, and the train hurled itself roaringly through the tube. After a time, she glanced timidly at the meditating clergyman, and her look fell swiftly from his face to the discarded, ten o'clock extra, lying by his side. She removed her dim gaze and let it travel casually about the car, but before long it returned again, pointedly, to the newspaper. Then, with some obvious hesitation, she bent forward and said, Excuse me, father, but would you please let me look at your paper a minute, sir? The clergyman came out of his reverie instantly, and looked up with almost an eager smile. Certainly. Keep it if you like, I am quite through with it. But, he said, in a pleasant deep voice, I am an Episcopal minister, not a priest. Oh sir, I beg your pardon, I thought. He dismissed the apology with a smile and a good-natured hand. The woman opened the paper with decent cotton-gloved fingers. The garish headlines told the story at a glance, Earth opened and swallowed Miss Hinch, 
headquarters virtually abandons case, even Jesse Dark, so the bold capitals ran on, seemed stumped. Below the spread was a luridly written but flimsy narrative, marked by Jesse Dark, which at once confirmed the odd implication of the caption. Jesse Dark, it was manifest, was one of those most extraordinary of the products of yellow journalism, a woman, crime expert, now in action. More than this, she was a crime expert to be taken seriously it seemed, no mere office desk sleuth, but an actual performer with unexpectedly enough a somewhat formidable list of notches on her gun. So much at least was to be gathered from her paper's loud display of Jesse Dark's triumphs, March 2, 1901. Caught Julia Victorian, alias Gregory, the brains of the Healy Ring kidnappers. October 7 to 29, 1903. Found Mrs. Trotwood and secured the letter that convicted her of the murder of her lover, Ellis E. Swan. December 17, 1903 ran down Charles Barch in a Newark laundry and trapped a confession from him. July 4, 1904, caught Mary Colloran and recovered the Stratford jewels. And so on, nine triumphs in all, and nearly every one of them, as the least observant reader could hardly fail to notice, involved the capture of a woman. Nevertheless, it could not be pretended that the snappy paragraphs in this evening's extra seemed to foreshadow a new or tenth triumph on the part of Jessie Dark at any early date, and the old serving woman in the car presently laid down the reeking sheet with an irrepressible sigh. The clergyman glanced toward her kindly. The sigh was so audible that it seemed to be almost an invitation, besides, public interest in the great case was a Freemasonry that made conversation between total strangers the rule wherever two or three were gathered together. You were reading about this strange mystery, perhaps. The woman, with a sharp intake of breath, answered, Yes, sir. Oh, sir. It seems as if I couldn't think of anything else. Ah, he said without surprise. It certainly appears to be a remarkable affair. Remarkable indeed the affair seemed. In a tiny little room within ten steps of Broadway, at half past nine o'clock on a fine evening, Miss Hinch had killed John Catherwood with the light sword she used in her well-known representation of the father of his country. Catherwood, it was known, had come to tell her of his approaching marriage, and ten thousand amateur detectives, a thirst for rewards, had required no further motive of a creature so notorious for fierce jealousy. So far the tragedy was commonplace enough, and even vulgar. What had redeemed it to romance from this point on was the extraordinary faculty of the woman, which had made her famous while she was still in her teens. Coarse, violent, utterly unmoral she might be, but she happened also to be the most astonishing impersonator of her time. Her brilliant act consisted of a series of character changes, many of them done in full sight of the audience with the assistance only of a small table of properties half concealed under a net. Some of these transformations were so amazing as to be beyond belief, even after one had sat and watched them. Not her appearance only, but voice, speech, manner, carriage, all shifted incredibly to fit the new part, so that the woman appeared to have no permanent form or fashion of her own, but to be only so much plastic human material out of which her cunning could mold at will man, woman, or child, great lady of the Louisan court or Tammany statesman with the modernist of East Side modernisms upon his lip. With this strange skill, hitherto used only to enthrall huge audiences and wring extortionate contracts from managers, the woman known as Miss Hinch, she appeared to be without a first name, was now fighting for her life somewhere against the police of the world. Without artifice, she was a tall, thin-chested young woman with strongly marked features and considerable beauty of a bold sort. What she would look like at the present moment nobody could even venture a guess. Having stabbed John Catherwood in her dressing room at the amphitheater, she had put on her hat and coat, dropped two wigs and her makeup kit into a handbag, and walked out into Broadway. Within ten minutes the dead body of Catherwood was found and the chase begun. At the stage door, as she passed out, Miss Hinch had met an acquaintance, a young comedian named Dargis, and exchanged a word of greeting with him. That had been two weeks ago. After Dargis, no one had seen her. 
The earth, indeed, seemed to have opened and swallowed her. Yet her natural features were almost as well known as a president's, and the newspapers of a continent were daily reprinting them in a thousand variations. A very remarkable case, repeated the clergyman rather absently, and his neighbor, the old woman, respectfully agreed that it was. After that, she hesitated a moment, and then added, with sudden bitterness, Oh, they'll never catch her, sir, never. She's too smart for em all, Miss Hinch is. Attracted by her tone, the stout divine inquired if she was particularly interested in the case. Yes, sir, I got reason to be. Jack Catherwood's mother and me was at school together, and great friends all our life long. Oh, sir, she went on, as if in answer to his look of faint surprise, Jack was a fine gentleman, with manners and looks and all beyond his people. But he never grew away from his old mother, sir, no, sir, never. And I don't believe ever a Sunday passed that he didn't go up and set the afternoon away with her, talking and laughing just like he was a little boy again. Maybe he done things he hadn't thought, as high-spirited lads will, but oh sir, he was a good boy in his heart, a good boy. And it does seem too hard for him to die like that, and that hussy free to go her way, ruinin' and killin', my good woman, said the clergyman presently. Compose yourself. No matter how diabolical this woman's skill is, her sin will assuredly find her out. The woman dutifully lowered her handkerchief and tried to compose herself, as bidden. But oh, sir, she's that clever, diabolical, just as ye say sir through poor Jack we of course heard much gossip about her, and they do say that her best tricks was not done on the stage at all. They say sir, that, sittin' around a table with her friends, she could begin and twist her face so strange and terrible that they would beg her to stop, and jump up and run from the table, frightened out of their lives sir, grown-up people, by the terrible faces she could make. And let her only step behind her screen for a minute, for she kept her secrets well, Miss Hinch did, and she'd come walking out to you, and you could go right up to her in the full light and take her, hand, and still you couldn't make yourself believe that it was her. Yes, said the clergyman, I have heard that she is remarkably clever, though, as a stranger in this part of the world, one never saw her act. I must say, it is all very interesting and strange. He turned his head and stared through the rear door of the car at the dark flying walls. At the same moment the woman turned her head and stared full at the clergyman. When he turned back, her gaze had gone off toward the front of the car, and he picked up the paper thoughtfully. I'm a visitor in the city, from Denver, Colorado, he said presently, and knew little or nothing about the case until an evening or two ago, when I attended a meeting of gentlemen here. The Men's Club of St. Matthias Church, perhaps you know the place. Upon my word, they talked of nothing else. I confess they got me quite interested in their gossip. So tonight I bought this paper to see what this extraordinary woman detective it employs had to say about it. We don't have such things in the West, you know. But I must say one was disappointed, after all the talk about her. Yes sir, indeed, and no wonder for she's told Mrs. Catherwood herself that she's never made such a failure as this, so far. It seemed like she could always catch women, sir, up to this. It seemed like she knew in her own mind just what a woman would do, where she'd try to hide and all, and so she could find them time and time when the men detectives didn't know where to look. But oh sir, she's never had to hunt for such a woman as Miss Hinch before. No. I suppose not, said the clergyman. Her story here in the paper certainly seems to me very poor. Story, sir. Bless my soul, suddenly exploded the old gentleman across the aisle, to the surprise of both. You don't suppose the clever little woman is going to show her hand in those stories, with Miss Hinch in the city and reading every line of them? The approach to his station, it seemed, had roused him from his nap just in time to overhear the episcopate criticism. Now he answered the looks of the old woman and the clergyman with an elderly cackle. Excuse my intrusion, I'm sure. But I can't sit silent and hear anybody run down Jesse Dark, Miss Mathewson in private life, as perhaps you don't know. 
No sir. Why, there's a man at my boarding place, astonishing young fellow named Hardy, Tom Hardy, who's known her for years. As to those stories sir, I can assure you that she puts in there exactly the opposite of what she really thinks. You don't tell me, said the clergyman encouragingly. Yes sir. Oh, she plays the game, yes, yes. She has her private ideas, her clues, her schemes. The woman doesn't live who is clever enough to hoodwink Jessie Dark. I look for developments any day, any day sir. A new voice joined in. The young couple down the car, their attention caught by the old man's pervasive tones, had been frankly listening, and it was illustrative of the public mind at the moment that, as they now rose for their station, the young fellow felt perfectly free to offer his contribution, tremendously dramatic situation, isn't it, gentlemen? Those two clever women pitted against each other in a life-and-death struggle, fighting it out silently in the underground somewhere, keen professional pride on one side and the fear of the electric chair on the other. Good heavens, there's, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Exclaimed the old gentleman rather testily. But, my dear sir, it's not professional pride that makes Jessie Dark so resolute to win. It's sex jealousy, if you follow me, no offense, madam. Yes, sir. Women never have the slightest respect for each other's abilities, not the slightest. No mercy for each other, either. I tell you, Jessie Dark D be ashamed to be beaten by another woman. Read her stories between the lines, sir, as I do. Invincible determination, no weakening, no mercy. You catch my point, sir. It sounds reasonable, answered the Colorado clergyman, with his courteous smile. All women, we are told, are natural rivals at heart, oh, I'm for Jessie Dark every time, the young fellow broke in eagerly, especially since the police have practically laid down. But, why, she's told my young friend Hardy, the old gentleman wrote him down, that she'll find Hinch if it takes her lifetime. Knows a thing or two about actresses, she says. Says the world isn't big enough for the creature to hide from her. Well. What do you think of that? Tell what we were just talking about, George, said the young wife, looking at her husband with grossly admiring eyes. But oh sir, began the old woman timidly, Jack Catherwood's been dead two weeks now, and, and, woman got on my car at nine o'clock tonight sir, interjected the subway guard, who having flung open the doors for the station was listening excitedly to the symposium, wore a brown veil and goggles. I'd a bet every dollar I had, two weeks, madam. And what is that, pray, exploded the old gentleman, rising triumphantly. A lifetime, if necessary. Oh, never fear. Mrs. Victorian was considered pretty clever, eh? Wasn't she? Remember what Jessie Dark did for her. Nan Parmalee too, though the police did their best to steal her credit. She'll do just as much for Miss Hinch, you may take it from me. But how's she going to make the capture gentleman, cried the young fellow, getting his chance at last. That's the point my wife and I've been discussing. Assuming that she succeeds in spotting this woman devil, what will she do? Now, do sir. Yell for the police, burst from the old gentleman at the door. And have Miss Hinch shoot her, and then herself, too. Wouldn't she have to, Grand Central, cried the guard, for the second time, and the young fellow broke off reluctantly to find his pretty wife towing him strongly toward the door. Hope she nabs her soon, anyway, he called back to the clergyman over his shoulder. The thing's getting on my nerves. One of these kindergarten reward chasers followed my wife for five blocks the other day, just because she's got a pointed chin, and I don't know what might have happened if I hadn't come along and, doors rolled shut behind him, and the train flung itself on its way. Within the car, a lengthy silence ensued. The clergyman stared thoughtfully at the floor, and the old woman fell back upon her borrowed paper. She appeared to be rereading the observations of Jessie Dark with considerable care. 
Presently she lowered the paper and began a quiet search for something under the folds of her shawl, and at length, her hands emerging empty, she broke the silence with a timid request, Oh sir, have you a pencil you could lend me, please? I'd like to mark something in the piece to send to Mrs. Catherwood. It's what she says here about the disguises, sir. The kindly divine felt in his pockets, and after some hunting produced a pencil, a fat white one with blue lead. She thanked him gratefully. How is Mrs. Catherwood bearing all this strain and anxiety? he asked suddenly. Have you seen her today? Oh, yes sir I've been spending the evening with her since seven o'clock, and am just back from there now. Oh, she's very much broke up sir. She looked at him hesitatingly. He stared straight in front of him, saying nothing, though he knew, in common with the rest of the reading world, that Jack Catherwood's mother lived, not on 126th Street, but on East 10th. Presently he wondered if his silence had not been an error of judgment. Perhaps that misstatement had not been a slip, but something cleverer. The woman went on with a certain eagerness, Oh sir, I only hope and pray those gentlemen may be right, but it does look to Mrs. Catherwood, and me too, that if Jessie Dark was going to catch her at all, she'd have done it before now. Look at those big, bold blue eyes she had sir, with lashes an inch long, they say and that terrible long chin of hers. They do say she can change the color of her eyes, not forever of course, but put a few of her drops into them and make them look entirely different for a time. But that chin sir, yet he say, she broke off, for the clergyman, without preliminaries of any sort, had picked up his heavy stick and suddenly risen. Here we are at 14th Street, he said, nodding pleasantly. I must change here. Good night. Success to Jesse Dark, I say. He was watching the woman's faded face intently, and he saw just that look of respectful surprise break into it that he had expected. Fourteenth Street, sir. I'd no notion at all we'd come so far. It's where I get out too, sir, the express is not stopping at my station. Ah, said the clergyman, with the utmost dryness. He led the way limping and leaning on his stick. They emerged upon the chill and cheerless platform, not exactly together, yet still with some reference to their acquaintanceship on the car. But the clergyman, after stumping along a few steps, all at once realized that he was walking alone, and turned. The woman had halted. Over the intervening space their eyes met. Come, said the man, gently. Oh sir, it's too kind of you sir, said the woman, coming forward. From other cars two or three blue-nosed people had got off to make the change, one or two more came straggling in from the street, but, scattered over the bleak concrete expanse, they detracted little from the isolation that seemed to surround the woman and the clergyman. Step for step, the odd pair made their way to the extreme northern end of the platform. By the way, said the clergyman, halting abruptly, may I see that paper again for a moment? Oh, yes sir, of course, said the woman, producing it from beneath her shawl. If you want it back sir, he said that he wanted only to glance at it for a moment, but he fell to looking through it page by page, with considerable care. The woman glanced at him several times with timid respect. Finally she said hesitatingly, I think sir, I'll ask the ticket chopper how long before the next train. I'm very late as it is sir, and one still must stop to get something to eat before I go to bed. An excellent idea, said the clergyman. He explained that he, too, was already an hour behind time, and was spending the night with cousins in Newark, to boot. Side by side, they retraced their steps down the platform, ascertained the schedule from the sleepy chopper, and, as by some tacit consent, started slowly back again. But, before they had gone very far, the woman all at once stopped short and, with a white face, leaned against the wall. Oh sir, I'm afraid I'll just have to stop and get a bite somewhere before I go on. You'll think me foolish sir, but I missed my supper entirely tonight, and there is quite a faint feeling coming over me. The clergyman looked at her with apparent concern. Do you know, my friend, 
you seem to anticipate all my own wants. Your mentioning something to eat just now reminded me that I myself was all but famishing. He glanced at his watch, appearing to deliberate. Yes, there is still time before my train. Come, we will find a modest eating place together. Oh sir, she stammered, with a blush, but, you wouldn't want to eat with a poor old woman like me sir. And why not? Are we not all equal in the sight of God? They ascended the stairs together, like any prosperous parson and his poor parishioner, and, coming out into 14th Street, started west. On the first block they came to a restaurant, a brilliantly lighted, tiled and polished place of the quick lunch variety. But the woman timidly preferred not to stop here, saying that the glare of such places was very bad for her old eyes. The kindly divine accepted the objection as valid, without argument. Two blocks farther on they found on a corner a quieter resort, an unpretentious little haven which yet boasted a lady's entrance down the side street. They entered by the front door, and sat down at a table, facing each other. The woman read the menu through, and finally, after much embarrassed uncertainty, ordered poached eggs on toast. The clergyman ordered the same. The simple meal was soon dispatched. Just as they were finishing it, the woman said apologetically, If you'll excuse me sir, could I see the bill of fare a minute? I think I'd best take a little pot of tea to warm me up, if they do not charge too high. I haven't the bill of fare, said the clergyman. They looked diligently for the cardboard strip, but it was nowhere to be seen. The waiter drew near. Yes, ma'am. I certainly left it there on the table when I took the order. I'm sure I can't imagine what's become of it, repeated the clergyman, rather insistently. He looked hard at the woman, and found that she was looking hard at him. Both pairs of eyes fell instantly. The waiter brought another bill of fare, the woman ordered tea, the waiter came back with it. The clergyman paid for both orders with a dollar bill that looked hard-earned. The tea proved to be very hot, it could not be drunk down at a gulp. The clergyman, watching the woman intently as she sipped, seemed to grow more and more restless. His fingers drummed the tablecloth, he could h-a-r-d-l-y sit still. All at once he said, what is that calling in the street? It sounds like newsboys. The woman put her old head on one side and listened. Yes sir there seems to be an extra out. Upon my word, he said, after a pause, I believe I'll go get one. Good gracious. Crime is a very interesting thing, to be sure. He rose slowly, took down his shovel hat from the hanger near him, and, grasping his heavy stick, limped to the door. Leaving it open behind him, much to the annoyance of the proprietor in the cashier's cage, he stood a moment in the little vestibule, looking up and down the street. Then he took a few slow steps eastward, beckoning with his hand as he went, and so passed out of sight of the woman at the table. The eating place was on the corner, and outside the clergyman paused for half a breath. North, east, south, and west he looked, and nowhere he found what his flying glance sought. He turned the corner into the darker cross street, and began to walk, at first slowly, continually looking about him. Presently his pace quickened, quickened so that he no longer even stayed to use his stout cane. In another moment he was all but running, his club foot pounding the icy sidewalk heavily as he went. A newsboy thrust an extra under his very nose, and he did not even see it. Far down the street, nearly two blocks away, a tall figure in a blue coat stood and stamped in the freezing sleet, and the hurrying divine sped straight toward him. But he did not get very near. For, as he passed the side entrance at the extreme rear of the restaurant, a departing guest dashed out so recklessly as to run full into him, stopping him dead. Without looking at her, he knew who it was. In fact, he did not look at her at all, but turned his head hurriedly east and west, sweeping the dark street with a swift eye. But the old woman, having drawn back with a sharp exclamation as they collided, rushed breathlessly into apologies, Oh sir, excuse me sir. 
A newsboy popped his head into the side door just after you went out, sir, and I ran to him to get you the paper. But he got away too quick for me, sir, and so I, exactly, said the clergyman in his quiet deep voice. That must have been the very boy I myself was after. On the other side, two men had just turned into the street, well muffled against the night, talking cheerfully as they trudged along. Now the clergyman looked full at the woman, and she saw that there was a smile on his face. As he seems to have eluded us both, suppose we return to the subway. Yes sir, it's full time I, the sidewalk is so slippery, he went on gently, perhaps you had better take my arm. The woman did as she was bidden. Behind the pair in the dingy restaurant, the waiter came forward to shut the door, and lingered to discuss with the proprietor the sudden departure of his two patrons. However, the score had been paid in full, with a liberal tip for service, so there was no especial complaint to make. After listening to some markedly unfavorable comments on the ways of the clergy, the waiter returned to his table to set it in order for the next customer. On the floor in the carpeted aisle between tables lay a white rectangle of cardboard, which his familiar eye easily recognized as one of his own bills of fare, face downward. He stooped and picked it up. On the back of it was some scribbling, made with a blue lead pencil. The handwriting was very loose and irregular, as if the writer had had his eyes elsewhere while he wrote, and it was with some difficulty that the waiter deciphered this message, Miss Hinch 14th ST Subway Get Police Quick The waiter carried this curious document to the proprietor, who read it over a number of times. He was a dull man, and had a dull man's suspiciousness of a practical joke. However, after a good deal of irresolute discussion, he put on his overcoat and went out for a policeman. He turned west, and halfway up the block met an elderly bluecoat sauntering east. The policeman looked at the scribbling, and dismissed it profanely as a wag's foolishness of the sort that was bothering the life out of him a dozen times a day. He walked along with the proprietor, and as they drew near to the latter's place of business, both became aware at the same moment of footsteps thudding nearer up the cross street from the south. As they looked up, two young policemen, accompanied by a man in a uniform like a streetcar conductor's, swept around the corner and dashed straight into the restaurant. The first policeman and the proprietor ran in after them, and found them staring about rather vacantly. One of the breathless arms of the law demanded if any suspicious characters had been seen about the place, and the dull proprietor said no. The officers, looking rather flat, explained their errand. It seemed that a few moments before, the third man, who was a ticket chopper at the subway station, had found a mysterious message lying on the floor by his box. Whence it had come, how long it had lain there, he had not the slightest idea. However, there it was. The policeman exhibited a crumpled white scrap torn from a newspaper, on which was scrawled in blue pencil, Miss Hinch Miller's restaurant get police quick the first policeman, who was both the oldest and the fattest of the three, produced the message on the bill of fare, so utterly at odds with this. The dull proprietor, now bethinking himself, mentioned the clergyman and the old woman who had taken poached eggs and tea together, called for a second bill of fare, and departed so unexpectedly by different doors. The ticket chopper recalled that he had seen the same pair at his station, they had come up, he remembered, and questioned him closely about trains. The three policemen were momentarily puzzled by this testimony. But it was soon plain to them that if either the woman or the clergyman really had any information about Miss Hinch, a highly improbable supposition in itself, they would never have stopped with peppering the neighborhood with silly little contradictory messages. They're a pair of old fools trying to have sport with police, and I'd like to run them in for it, growled the fattest of the officers, and this was the general verdict. The little conference broke up. The dull proprietor returned to his cage, the waiter to his table, the subway men departed on the run for his chopping box, the three policemen passed out into the bitter night. They walked together, grumbling, and their feet, perhaps by some subconscious impulse, turned eastward toward the subway. And in the middle of the next block a man came running up to them. Officer, look what I found on the sidewalk a minute ago. Read that scribble. 
He held up a white slab which proved to be a bill of fare from Miller's restaurant. On the back of it the three peering officers saw, almost illegibly scrawled in blue pencil, police. Miss Hinch 14th ST sub with a hand trailed off on the W as though the writer had been suddenly interrupted. The fat policeman blasphemed and threatened arrests. But the second policeman, who was dark and wiry, raised his head from the bill of fare and said suddenly, Tim, I believe there's something in this. There'd ought to be ten days on the island in it for them, growled fat Tim. Suppose, now, said the other policeman, staring intently at nothing, the old woman was Miss Hinch herself, for instance, and the parson was shadowing her while pretending, he never suspicioned her, and Miss Hinch not daring, to cut and run for it till she was sure she had a clean getaway. Well now, Tim, what better could he do, that's right, exclaimed the third policeman. Specially when ye think that Hinch carries a gun, and will use it, too. Why not have a look in at the subway station anyway, the three of us? This proposal carried the day. The three officers started for the subway, the citizen following. They walked at a good pace and without more talk, and both their speed and their silence had a subtle psychological reaction. As the minds of the four men turned inward upon the odd behavior of the pair in Miller's restaurant, the conviction that, after all, something important might be afoot grew and strengthened within each one of them. Unconsciously their pace quickened. It was the dark, wiry policeman who first broke into an open run, but the three other men had been for twenty paces on the verge of it. However, these consultations and vacillations had taken time. The stout clergyman and the poor old woman had five minutes start of the officers of the law, and that, as it happened, was all that the occasion required. On 14th Street, as they made their way arm in arm to the station, they were seen, and remembered, by a number of belated pedestrians. It was observed by more than one that the woman lagged as if she were tired, while the club-footed divine, supporting her on his arm, steadily kept her up to his own brisk gait. So walking, the pair descended the subway steps, came out upon the bare platform again, and presently stood once more at the extreme uptown end of it, just where they had waited half an hour before. Nearby a careless porter had overturned a bucket of water, and a splotch of thin ice ran out and over the edge of the concrete. Two young men who were taking lively turns up and down distinctly heard the clergyman warn the woman to look out for this ice. Far away to the north was to be heard the faint roar of an approaching train. The woman stood nearest the track, and the clergyman stood in front of her. In the vague light their looks met, and each was struck by the pallor of the other's face. In addition, the woman was breathing hard, and her hands and feet betrayed some nervousness. It was difficult now to ignore the too patent fact that for an hour they had been clinging desperately to each other, at all costs, but the clergyman made a creditable effort to do so. He talked ramblingly, in a kind voice, for the most part of the deplorable weather and his train to Newark, for which he was now so late. And all the time both of them were incessantly turning their heads toward the station entrance, as if expecting some arrival. As he talked, the clergyman kept his hands unobtrusively busy. From the bottom edge of his black sack coat he drew a pin, and stuck it deep into the ball of his middle finger. He took out his handkerchief to dust the hard sleet from his broad hat, and under his overcoat he pressed the handkerchief against his bleeding finger. While making these small arrangements, he held the woman's eyes with his own, chatting kindly, and, still holding them, he suddenly broke off his random talk and peered at her cheek with concern. My good woman, you've scratched your cheek somehow. Why, bless me, it's bleeding quite badly. Never mind, said the woman, and swept her eyes hurriedly toward the entrance. But, good gracious, I must mind. The blood will fall on your shawl. If you will permit me, ah. Uh. Too quick for her, he leaned forward and, through the thin veil, swept her cheek hard with his handkerchief. And, removing it, held it up so that she might see the blood for herself. But she did not glance at the handkerchief, and neither did he. His gaze was riveted upon her cheek, which looked smooth and clear where he had smudged the clever wrinkles away. 
Down the steps and upon the platform pounded the feet of three flying policemen. But it was quite evident now that the express would thunder in just ahead of them. The clergyman, standing close in front of the woman, took a firmer grip on his heavy stick and smiled full into her face. Miss Hinch, you are not so terribly clever, after all. The woman sprang back from him with an irrepressible exclamation, and in that moment her eye fell upon the police. Unluckily, her foot slipped upon the treacherous ice, or it may have tripped on the stout cane when the clergyman suddenly shifted its position. And in the next breath the front of the express train roared past. By one of those curious circumstances that sometimes refute all experience, the body of the woman was not mangled or mutilated in the least. There was a deep blue bruise on the left temple, and apparently that was all, even the ancient hat remained on her head, skewered fast by the long pin. It was the clergyman who found the body, huddled anyhow at the side of the track where the train had flung it, he who covered the still face and superintended the removal to the platform. Two eyewitnesses of the tragedy pointed out the ice on which the unfortunate woman had slipped, and described their horror as they saw her companion spring forward just too late to save her. Not wishing to bring on a delirium of excitement among the half-dozen chance bystanders, two policemen drew the clergyman quietly aside and showed him the three mysterious messages. Much affected by the shocking end of his sleuthery as he was, he readily admitted having written them. He briefly recounted how the woman's strange movements on 126th Street had arrested his attention, and how, watching her closely on the car, he had finally detected that she wore a wig. Unfortunately, however, her suspicions appeared to have been aroused by his interest in her, and thereafter a long battle of wits had ensued between them, he trying to call the police without her knowledge, she dogging him close to prevent that, and at the same time watching her chance to give him the slip. He rehearsed how, in the restaurant, when he had invented an excuse to leave her for an instant, she had made a bolt and narrowly missed getting away, and finally how, having brought her back to the subway and seeing the police at last near, he had exposed her makeup and called her name, with unexpectedly shocking results. And now, he concluded in a shaken voice, I am naturally most anxious to know whether I am right, or have made some terrible mistake. Will you look at her, officer? and tell me if it is, she. But the fat policeman shook his head over the well-known ability of Miss Hinch to look like everybody else in the world but herself. It'll take God Almighty to tell ye that sir, saving your presence. I'll leave it at our headquarters, he continued, as if that were the same thing. But, if it is her, she's gone to her reward sir. God pity her, said the clergyman. Amen. Give me your name sir they may want ye in the morning. The clergyman gave it, Rev. Theodore Shaler, of Denver, city address, 245 East 126th Street. Having thus discharged his duty in the affair, he started sadly to go away, but, passing by the silent figure stretched on a bench under the ticket seller's overcoat, he bared his head and stopped for one last look at it. The parson's gentleness and efficiency had already won favorable comments from the bystanders, and of the first quality he now gave a final proof. The dead woman's balled-up handkerchief, which somebody had recovered from the track and laid upon her breast, had slipped to the floor, and the clergyman, observing it, stooped silently to restore it again. This last small service chanced to bring his head close to the head of the dead woman, and, as he straightened up again, her projecting hatpin struck his cheek and ripped a straight line down it. This in itself would have been a trifle, since scratches soon heal. But it happened that the point of the hatpin caught under the lining of the clergyman's perfect beard and ripped it clean from him, so that, as he rose with a sudden shrill cry, he turned upon the astonished onlookers the bare, smooth chin of a woman, curiously long and pointed. There was only one such chin in the world, and the very urchins in the street would have known it at a glance. Amid a sudden uproar which ill became the presence of the dead, the police closed in on Miss Hinch and handcuffed her with violence, fearing suicide, if not some new witchery, and at the station house an unemotional matron divested the famous impersonator of the last and best of all her many disguises. This much the police did. 
but it was quite distinctly understood that it was Jesse Dark who had really made the capture, and the papers next morning printed pictures of the unconquerable little woman and of the hatpin with which she had reached back from another world to bring her greatest adversary to justice.